Microscopes are a great tool for identifying insects because they allow you to see parts of the insect that you can't see with a naked eye. So there are a variety of different types of microscopes. The type that we have in front of me here is a stereo microscope. This is used to view larger objects or entire objects, so something like this bee here that is a whole insect. Uh, other types of microscopes that you might be familiar with or that you might have used in the past include compound microscopes, which are used to view things like slide-mounted insects and other uh, slide-mounted objects. Uh, compound microscopes typically have a greater magnification, so you can see smaller details on this you can view slides under a stereo microscope, but you generally don't have the zoom or resolution that you need to see the characters. Other types of microscopes that you might have heard of are things like scanning electron microscopes that are big, bulky objects that take up an entire room. Other differences between stereo microscopes and compound microscopes are where the light comes from. In a stereo microscope, the light generally comes from up on top in some manner. There are a variety of different ways to light the microscope, but it's generally coming from on top. With compound microscopes, the light is generally coming from the bottom and illuminating the slide, which is why you need a clear glass slide to let the light shine through. So there are a variety of different parts to a microscope. Uh, all of which can be adjusted to suit the needs of what you're looking at. So first, we need to know how to turn the light on. On this model here, there's a knob that you just turn on and you can see the light coming down from on top. Uh, in other types of microscopes, you might have a flip button or a push button, uh, but there's generally some way to light the microscope up. Once you've got a specimen under the microscope, you'll want to adjust it so you can see it in focus and there are a variety of ways to do that. The first one is the coarse focus, which you can see here raises the head of the microscope up and down. That is a very coarse way to run the magnification. Other microscopes, not this one in particular, uh, will have a fine focus that can then let you zoom in even closer at a finer scale. Most microscopes will have some kind of zoom on them. Uh, depending on the quality of the microscope, the zoom may vary. Uh, this model in particular has a 2x and a 4x zoom, and those can be chosen by rotating this knob right here under the head of the microscope. So I'm on 4x now. If I turn it clockwise halfway around, it goes to 2x. In this model of microscope, depending on how high the insect or the object that you're looking at is, the coarse focus may not be enough to get it into focus. So you can turn this knob in the back and lower or raise the entire head of the microscope. When you're looking at an insect on a pin, you generally want to have it at the topmost level, but if you're looking at something like a slide that's all the way on the base of the microscope, you will probably want to lower this down and then use the coarse focus up and down until this is in focus. One aspect of this microscope in front of me are these little, um, pieces of spring steel. Uh, these are used to hold things like microscope slides in place, like that. If you are looking at an insect on a stage like this, these generally just kind of get in the way, so you can move them out of the way if need be. Uh, in this particular scope also has screws here, so if you need to just remove them completely, you can do that as well. Depending on the specimen that you're looking at, uh, you can adjust the base color. It's either white, or you can pull this up and flip it over and it's black. When you're sorting samples in alcohol, I often find that it's easier to have a black base uh, so that when you're looking, it has a nice black background to look at those specimens. However, when you are looking at an insect specimen uh, on the scope, especially if you do something like move the specimen off of the stage, it's often easier to have a white background. This model of scope and many others also have a second stage that is completely glass. So in this example, there is a secondary light that is down in here that you can turn on. If you want bottom illumination, you can use the glass plate here and get bottom illumination to look at certain samples. For insect identification, that's not generally used, but it can be useful in sorting certain types of samples or for other types of objects. One last aspect of the microscope that can be used is some microscopes come with uh, these rubber eyepieces that can be put 
onto the eyepieces is options. Um, and when you look at the scope, they're supposed to help keep light or distractions from coming in from the side. I find them difficult to use, so I typically work without them. But if it, you find it's something that you do enjoy or that helps you, you are certainly welcome to use them as well. If you can't see your specimen very well, uh, in this case, I can see the specimen all right. It's just kind of dark. I can't see very many features on it. And then I look back and notice that the light is not turned on. Turning the light on, in this case, there's enough ambient light from outside of the microscope to see a little bit to find the specimen. But once you turn that light on, it, it brightens up and you can actually see features on the insect. If you look through a microscope and don't see any light, there could be a, a different type of problem. One, in the case of this microscope, the zoom um, is two different sets of lenses. So if it's caught between those lenses and you look, there's just not really anything there because the lenses in the zoom aren't lined up with the eyepieces. So you have to turn that until it clicks in place. Another reason that you may not be able to see specimens is that there's a lens cap either on the eyepieces themselves or on the lens on the bottom. Many stereo microscopes have an inbuilt light source. This one has a light source up here that can't be adjusted. There are other options for lighting, including things like these gooseneck lights. So these are fiber optic, and you can see they can be adjusted any which way, and they often come in from the side. And you can adjust them, say have one down low on the right and another up higher at a steeper angle on the left. And when you manipulate these kind of lights, you can often see characters on the specimen that you wouldn't have seen otherwise, especially on brightly colored or metallic specimens. Um, it really helps bring out things like lines and pits in the cuticle. And this can really help if you have them available in seeing certain characters that uh, using a light source that can't move may be difficult to see uh, because you can't manipulate the light sources. One of the most common issues that I encounter with students using microscopes is that they can only see through one eyepiece. And often when I see them doing this, they'll be squinting and kind of looking at it from the side because they can only see through the one eye. And there are a couple of different issues that could be at play here. First, the eyepieces can be adjusted in and out. People have different widths of eyes in their heads. And if the person before you had much wider eyes or much narrower eyes than you, the eyepieces may be adjusted for them, but you can't see through them. So in this case, these eyepieces are way too wide for my face. So I come in, I can see through one eyepiece, but I can't see through my left eye. In this case, I will adjust the eyepieces in until I can see through my right eye, and I'll keep adjusting the left side and bring it in, and then I can see through the left side. So another issue that people often have with the eyepieces is that one or both of them can be out of focus. So in this case, the right eyepiece doesn't change in focus, while the left eyepiece can zoom in and out just a little bit to get it in focus with the right. So if you look at through the eyepieces and one side is crisp and the other is blurry, it may be that the adjustable eyepiece is off. So to fix this, you find the eyepiece that doesn't adjust, in this case, the right-hand side, and we'll look through there and use the coarse focus to adjust up and down until what we see is in focus. And then you're gonna close that eye. So I'm gonna close my right eye and look through the side that can be adjusted and then spin or turn the eyepiece to adjust it until that eyepiece is also in focus. So now the left side, that adjustable side is in focus. And if I open both eyes, I can see both sides are in focus to the exact same level and everything is nice and crisp. One of the issues that I find that students and other people that are first using microscopes often run into is how to even find the specimen under the microscope. Especially if you're coming at the microscope and it hasn't been used before, perhaps it got bumped and the adjustments were offset. 
How do you find an, a specimen under the microscope that you can't even see? So you'll want to go and check all of the adjustments. So first I noticed that the zoom on this particular microscope is on 4x, and that is too zoomed in. It's useful later it, once you've got the specimen under the microscope where you want it, but it's too close for right now, so we'll adjust that back to 2x. The other thing I noticed is that the head of the microscope is very close to the B. So we're going to go ahead and raise the head of this microscope up. And now that should be about right. So I'm going to take a look through here and move the B around until I see it. And there I've found it. And the B in here is not in focus. I can see actually the label quite well. I can read that, but the B itself is fuzzy. So I'm going to come here to the course adjusting knob and turn it and raise it up until I see the B in focus. In there, I can see it. If you turn the focus the wrong way, uh, you should be able to tell pretty quickly because things will, will get out of focus and continue to get out of focus. Depending on the microscope, you can adjust this all the way down if you're not careful until you hit the specimen. Now I can't do that with this one because I have to adjust the course knob first, uh, but you can do that in certain models where you zoom down so closely you hit the pin or the specimen or something else under here. Which would be bad. Which would be bad. Uh, one thing to say about this too is when you're adjusting this course focus knob, make sure to hold on to the head of the microscope. If you let it go, it's just going to slam down onto the specimen onto this cork block here, potentially breaking the insect, potentially breaking the microscope. So you want to be very careful when you're adjusting this. Uh, if the specimen is not in focus, turn it slowly one direction or the other. If you find that it's not becoming in focus, try turning it the other way because you may be going the wrong direction. So when you're looking at an insect to identify, you often have to look at that specimen from multiple different angles to see different characters. You can't look at an insect and see bits of the wing and then expect to also see bits of the leg using that same uh, view. So when we're looking at an insect, often you have to manipulate the specimen and turn and adjust it. My favorite tool for doing this is just a simple piece of cork block with a cork on top. To look at a specimen from on top, you simply just put the pin into the cork block and you can see it from on top. To see the specimen from the side, you would then put the pin into the cork and you can see the specimen from the side. In this case, if we're going to look at the wing, we can see that. You can turn it while it's in the, the cork to see the face. You can turn it to see the abdomen. And I'm going to pull the labels off of this. And then if you need to see the specimen from underneath, sometimes there are characters on the bottom of the abdomen or the bottom of the thorax, or you just need to get an angle on the legs that you can't get otherwise. Uh, there are a couple of ways to do that. One, if the cork has some small divots in it, you can put the head of the pin into those divots and the specimen will stay upside down. Uh, this typically raises the specimen up quite high, so you are going to have to adjust your course focus and perhaps even the uh, knob that adjusts the head. The other option, which I don't have here, is to get a piece of Play-Doh or a piece of clay, something nice and soft that you can stick onto, and the specimen fell. <laughs> you have to be very careful when you have specimens upside down because they have a tendency to do that. The other option is to get a piece of Play-Doh or a piece of clay and put that on the cork block. Something that is nice and soft and malleable that you can turn the pin over and embed into. Uh, I don't have that here, but it's a cheap and easy way to alter uh, the basic setup of these cork stages. So other ways that you can manipulate instead of just straight up and down or just straight from the side, you can put the specimen in to the cork at basically any angle including almost upside down. And often this can help if you turn the stage to the side so you have a little bit more room. You can get the specimen so the pin even goes below the cork stage.
Sometimes when you're working with specimens, you find that the labels get in the way. In this case, it's very hard for me to see the underside of the specimen while there's labels there. In this case, you can take the labels off. You'll want to put these to the side, and not lose them, because if you lose the, those labels and that data, the specimen becomes useless. This also means that you don't want to have the labels off more than one specimen at a time because you don't want to get them confused. If you take the labels off of a specimen, as soon as you're done looking at that specimen where you need those labels off, put them back on before you move to the next specimen because you don't want to get these mixed up. If labels get mixed up or lost, this specimen now becomes useless and all of the time and effort that went into collecting it and curating it are to waste and the life of the insect is a waste. So this is a different style of stereo microscope. But like the first stereo microscope we saw, it has basically all of the same parts in basically the same position. So it has the on-off switch in a different place. You can see here is the coarse focus. And this particular model can go all the way up and all the way down using just the coarse focus. There's no knob on the back to adjust the head, which is nice. The other thing to note on this model is that there's no zoom on the bottom here, the zoom is actually up here, it's this knob on the side, which is adjustable just like the coarse focus. Like the other microscope, the eyepieces on this can adjust. Unlike the other microscope, both of the eyepieces here have a fine focus on the eyepiece themselves. Uh, so in this case, if one eyepiece is out of focus and the other eyepiece is in focus, uh, you can just adjust the eyepiece that is out of focus. The other thing to note about this microscope as opposed to the other model is that it has a adjustable ring light. So you can see here we can drop the light off, move it around. I'm generally not going to need to do that. So we'll just leave it in place. Just to note though that it does have a removable light uh, and it is a full ring light. So unlike the other microscope where you have light coming from one direction, you get a fully illuminated specimen that shouldn't have very many shadows on it, which is often quite nice. Whenever you're done with your microscope at the end of the day, you want to cover it with something to prevent dust from getting into it. The more dust gets in there, the, uh, you can often see dust through the eyepieces, which can uh, make it just unpleasant to use. If enough gets in there, it can actually ruin the microscope or you'll have to pay a few hundred to a few thousand dollars to get the microscope cleaned, which nobody wants to do. So at the end of the day, you should always uh, cover your microscope. Most of the time, they will have a dedicated um, cover. Uh, other, if it doesn't have such a cover, you could use something like a large enough plastic bag, anything to keep dust from settling on the microscope when it's not in use and getting into the internal mechanisms of it and messing up the optics. You always want to cover your microscope.